ICP monitor, let's talk a little bit about that. So this is monitoring via ventriculostomies. This has been going on since the 1970s. These are bedside procedures uh, that can be done in the ICU, in the ER, in the OR. And basically, many of you may have seen this, where you, you basically drill a hole that is about five millimeters in diameter, uh, open the door and pass the catheter down into the ventricle. Uh, this is done using external landmarks. Sometimes this can be challenging if the ventricles are small. However, frequently the ventricles will be dilated out. How much um, CSF do we make per hour? We make on the order of 0.3 cc's per minute, which translates out to about you know, 20 cc's per hour. So if the brain has to absorb all that, or if the brain can't absorb because it's blocked, then where does it get blocked? Well, it can block at the foramen of Monroe, in particular if there is pressure that's leading to swelling or edema. Okay, that's one of the places, or the, or the aqueduct of Sylvius. Those are some of the places where you can get blockage. And if you relieve that blockage by diverting it through a ventriculostomy, that can be very life-saving, right? Now, what are the problems with a ventriculostomy? Well, it's an invasive procedure. And many times we are hesitant to place it if the patient has a coagulopathy. Many times patients are in aspirin, plavix, eliquis, and we don't know exactly what um, their coagulation status is. So that's one of the things. However, the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines tell us that ventriculostomy is like the number one method for controlling ICP. And again, this can be uh, life-saving. There are some brain temperature measures that, be, that can be fixed to some of these catheters and some of these monitors. <clears throat> and so those are some of, the, some of the caveats with ICP monitoring. All right. Okay. This is an example of ventriculostomy replaced at bedside. This patient also had a hematoma here from an AVM. And what you can see is the blood is filling the ventricles, and these ventricles are dilated. This is a young patient, probably about 16 years old. And we can see the ventricles are bigger. So they're bigger than they would be. They should be about half that size. So you, the trajectory, pass the catheter down into the ventricle, cannulate the ventricle. And as you can see here, this is the CSF that emanates um, and it emanates under pressure. And once again, this is, can be life-saving. So that's something that early on uh, in training as a neurosurgeon, uh, you want to be able to master that technique. Now, the same technique, just parenthetically, of putting a ventricular catheter in is also the same technique used in chunts, all right? So you have a, a small kid who's got hydrocephalus for whatever reason, from a tumor or from congenital hydrocephalus or blockage of any of the pathways, they will dilate out their ventricles. And uh, one of the things I think that was uh, wanted to talk about is the Monroe Kelly curve. I don't have a slide for that on this particular deck here, but what we know is that uh, the brain can accommodate, you know, right, the intracranial pressure increase. But right around approximately the ICP starts to go up, um, right when, when you have about 30 cc's of volume, extra volume, whatever it is, okay? So the brain gets compressed, squeezed, edematous, there's blood in it, and then all of a sudden the ICP will go up. Uh, and that's where the ventriculostomy uh, can help because you're draining off the CSF component. Now, when we talk about ICP or what's in the brain, remember the brain is like a black box. So you have in the brain, you have the brain tissue, okay? You've got the ventricular system, okay, or CSF, and then you've got blood in the brains. So very quickly, let's go through what are the ways to treat ICP that we have? Well, we talked about ventricular drainage, draining off CSF so it doesn't back up. The other thing that you can do is you can apply hyperventilation. What does hyperventilation work on? It works on the arterioles. So it works on arterioles in the brain and causes the brain vessels to sort of contract. So there's less blood volume, all right? The problem with that and the caveat with that is that if you go too much, the brain becomes ischemic. So then you can have strokes or infarcts. Finally, when you talk about the brain tissue itself, you want to prune the brain, get the water out of the brain. What you can do is um, give hyperosmotic therapy, which is mannitol or hyper hypertonic saline. You may have heard of 3% normal saline or bolus of 3%. Those are things that you can give that will help, all right, um, shrink the brain and decrease help decrease the ICP, all right? 
Okay. Um, one of the controversies about um, about ICD monitoring is does it really make a difference? And this is for your reference. There was a trial called the Best Trip Trial that was authored by Randy Chestnut and his group uh, from Seattle as, as well as others, where they basically they randomized patients in South America and looked at whether or not uh, there was any improvement. Whether well, there's any difference, whether you use just clinical judgment, CAT scans, versus um, ICP monitoring. All right. And, and the ICP monitoring in this case was the intraparenchymal monitor, so it's not ventriculostomies. Right. And what they basically uh, found, all right, um, was that that there didn't seem to be a big difference, all right, in outcome. And, th and this has raised a lot of criticisms. And you go to any meeting now in the last couple of years, this is always debated that uh, that um, does this mean we don't need to do ICP monitoring? Is this still the standard of care? In, this, in the U.S., I don't think anybody's going to give ICP monitoring because it really helps you direct your therapy whether you give mannitol, whether you give hyperventilation, whether you then go do an operation, all right? Um, some of the caveats is that a lot of CT scans and, and the interpretations of the CT scans, if they're tight, if they're, uh, you know, ventricles are small, if the cisterns are small, you may more aggressively give them hypertonic saline or the mannitol hyperventilation. Let's talk a little bit about some of these uh, brain monitors. This is um, some of the monitors that are out there. This is the Lycox monitor. Uh, this is the Rometic. These are different monitors that are placed into the brain. They can be either put into the brain via a bolt type system. Again, when you say bolt, literally it means a bolt is bolted to the brain and it gives a very secure uh, uh, framework uh, for the monitor. You can also put these in directly in the brain or tunnel them directly into the brain, right? This is just some example of brain oxygenation. Why is this important, or is there any data for this? All right, once again, Randy Chestnut and his group uh, have this paper looking at uh, brain oxygen optimization. And basically, they randomize patients, whether you, uh, you direct your treatment based on brain oxygenation as well as ICP, or whether you don't. And what they found basically, and this is called the BOOST 2 trial, is that those patients where you optimized oxygenation had better outcomes. They estimate in the preliminary analysis that the decreased mortality with severe traumatic brain injury by 10%, which is significant because nothing has done this so far. Currently, there is now a BOOST 3 trial, which is a randomized controlled multi center trial across the country where people are looking at the targeted therapy to see if you optimize the oxygenation, whether you have better outcomes. Okay, um, once again, another uh, paper is showing that the improvement in oxygenation, uh, this just peripheral oxygenation was also associated with an improved outcome. And that makes sense because if you give the brain more substrate and if the brain is sensitive to hypoxia, um, you you want to um, optimize okay uh, optimize the um, brain oxygenation and metabolism okay clinical um, through microdialysis uh, has uh, has been used for uh, nearly twenty years okay clinically in Europe it has been approved for a long time in the U S it is FDA approved in in two thousand five okay so it's been used a long time um, what are the principles of it uh, basically, again, you review your Krebs cycle, and the long and short of it is that you are dialyzing, okay, and sampling the interstitium. And what we know is that these small molecules, lactate, pyruvate, uh, glucose, and oxygen are very important in brain metabolism, all right? And what's unique about the brain is that the brain is totally dependent upon glucose and oxygen. So if you don't have those, um, you know, the brain will die. And that's why the brain is so sensitive to traumatic brain injury as well as secondary insults. These are very small and fine catheters. This is for your reference here. This is 
the tip of the catheter about a centimeter sits in the brain. And again, we focus mostly on the glucose lactate pyruvate. And if you look at the lactate pyruvate ratio, that is a very, very powerful means of following and looking at the uh, brain metabolism. So if the lactate pyruvate ratio goes up, all right, meaning that either your lactate is going up or your pyruvate is going down, all right, those are signs of ischemia. And ischemia in general, meaning the brain or that portion of the brain is not getting enough blood or nutrients or glucose or oxygen. Okay. And this just shows sort of the setup. Uh, the catheter is tunneled into the brain, put directly into the brain, either via a bolt or directly in the brain. And it's collected here every hour. Uh, the nurses need to collect it every hour and send it to the lab where there's a device like this that analyzes it. And we have EPIC and EPIC on EPIC, you can see um, the results that are, that are provided, right? One of the challenges with this, and the reason you don't see it everywhere, uh, is because there's a lot of work to set up. Uh, there are a lot of regulations that are required, and there are just a few places in the country that, that do this. We do it pretty routinely at our place. And one of the key factors, uh, for those of you who might be interested in, is that this is UC Irvine. This is our hospital here. This is our clinical lab over here. So we keep the machine in the clinical lab. And initially, we started this out with people running the distance from here to here. So we had runners doing this, but that lasted about a week. Um, and what we then devised was using the um, tube system. So the nomadic tube system is part of the infrastructure of the hospital. So we send it through the nomadic tube, and the nurses love it because it's, you send it there, it ends up over here and over here, and then they, um, the, the lab will process everything for us. So the lab takes care of the uh, infrastructure for that. Okay. This is, our, this is a summary of our experience. Okay, with this. And we use it routinely in patients. However, we reserve it for the most serious, um, sickest patients with either intracerebral hemorrhage, uh, stroke, or traumatic brain injury, with a bias towards traumatic brain injury, because that's where most of the data is. Uh, this is the number of samples uh, that are run per patient. So you think about it, we run a, you know, one every hour. So basically every hour, the nurses collect a sample and it's run every hour. Uh, and the sample number of samples per patient goes up, the, the more number of days you do it with the number of catheters you have per patient. And usually we put more than one catheter, one in the good area, one in the bad area. Okay. Um, again, this is just some of the some of the papers out there showing that there is that this has been used. Uh, the the group in England at Cambridge are very very much uh, using this. Okay. And uh, again, in Europe, they're ahead of us in in the U uh, in the U.S. because they've been doing this now for for many years. It can use be used also for cerebral microdialysis in subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, uh, and you can find a schema. You think about with subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, what happens, they frequently get vasospasm or DCI. So what happens is the vessels start to spasm after the aneurysm, usually day four or five, but you can't tell for sure. But if you continuously monitor the brain uh, metabolism, uh, it has been shown that you can pick this up even, even half a day or so before it becomes manifest. Okay. Once again, this is in subarachnoid hemorrhage, okay? And these can be placed via a bolt or directly in the brain, all right? This is one example of a multimodal brain monitoring um, that one of my chief residents drew a picture of. And you can see this is a quad lumen bolt. There are four things that you can put in here through a single bolt that's about 5.3 millimeters in diameter. Uh, this is your hemodex or blood flow. This is your microdialysis. This is your ICP. And this is your oxygenation. Some people will instead put EEG EP electrodes in there too, which we use for looking at cortical spreading. An example of how you can put it in at directly at the time of surgery. Um, we do a lot of open craniotomies and also craniectomies, decompressive hemicraniectomy. I think you're going to hear about that in one of the uh, seminars uh, this month uh, or this set of sessions. Uh, and we put them in at the time of surgery 
you just put them in at the edge of the uh, bone flap. And it, the beauty of that is you have direct visualization, so you don't worry as much about hitting a vessel or, or hurting a vessel. Okay. Is it all about ICP? Well, this is your typical decompressive hemicraniectomy. Now, what you're doing here is you're taking the bone off, opening up the dura, putting a patch on, doing a duroplasty, giving it much more room. All right, so what you do then is you, and this is well known that by doing this, you can decrease the ICP to the normal range. Is that all you need to do then? Is that all it's about? Well, no, because if you look at the studies, and once again, I think you're going to have some talks about some of these other um, uh, trials uh, looking at tra traumatic brain injury. And basically, both of these trials showed that although you had an increased number of survivors, the problem was that the neurological outcome was not improved. In fact, you had more vegetative or debilitated people, all right? So that has put a sort of a damper on uh, decompressive hemicraniectomies. And we all do them, and we know that the ICPs are decreased and then controllable, and the residents love it because they never have to, I don't have to see the patient anymore because the ICPs are controlled, or they won't pick as many calls. So what this brings us to is the whole concept of multimodal brain monitoring and why we do it, okay? Um, because it's really not all about um, ICPs. There's more to it than that. And what we're starting to realize is not just ICPs. Yes, ICPs is what drives us, but also optimal cerebral blood flow, optimal oxygenation, optimal energy flow, glucose utilization, delivery of glucose. All these are uh, important uh, the, uh, for uh, the brain recovery, all right? And so I think that a lot more of the direction in the future is going towards looking at these multimodal monitors, looking at other things, and truly optimizing uh, the injured brain. Okay. So what is the driving force okay, of all the problems that we face? Okay, is it, you know, and I think that most of us, you know, if you agree that cerebral edema is driving a lot of what's going on, all right? And why is that? Well, cerebral edema, okay, will occur around an area of injury, whether it's a hemorrhage, whether it's a contusion, whether it's a, whether it's, um, a subdural hematoma, there is going to be cerebral edema that's elicited around the contusion, all right? So what is happening? There's a cascade of injury that occurs, and if you sample in this perihematoma area, this dark area here, all right, what we know is that there's a whole cascade that is going on, okay, with mitochondrial dysfunction, changes in many of the pro-inflammatory processes that are just taking off, okay? And so what many of us are doing are looking at these areas of contusion to see if we intervene, if we are able to remove the blood clot or the hemorrhage, does that attenuate it? Well, attenuates it because it attenuates the local pressure. But on top of that, you are going to intervene with the, the process of blood breakdown products, okay? Because we know that blood has what in it? What does blood have in it? It's got iron in it, right? And when iron breaks down, iron is very toxic. And so the whole toxicity of that okay, will be decreased if you get rid of some of that. And there are there's our major studies going on about that. Here's just a little bit about the blood flow. Okay, what we're looking at, this is the blood flow monitor, and you're optimizing cerebral blood flow, all right? And this is a measure of that. Now, the problem with this, this is a very um, focal probe, so it can measure the blood flow in one area. But also hidden in there, the estimate of the brain water content, all right? Because um, in the blood flow monitor, there's a constant there called the K constant that, that is built in to help measure the blood flow. And what we know is that if you back calculate, and there's some um, calculations in there, you can calculate out the percentage water content that's in there. And the paper that talks a little bit about that. Yeah. We talk a little bit about this about cerebral edema, and this is the answer here, number three. Okay, blood and its breakdown products are one of the big drivers for that.
everyone. Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.